involved in memorizing the scriptures placed in the bulletin a while ago learned this one it says Jesus replied love the, the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It was when I read those that it struck me what was being said. Luke records Jesus saying this to a religious man who came to him and said, what should I do to be saved? And Jesus said to him, what do you read in the law? And he, that man, recited from memory these verses. And Jesus said, you're right. Do that and you will live. Then it says the man wanted to justify himself. He wanted a way out. And so he said, uh, yes, and who is my neighbor? How far do you want me to go with this, Lord? And Jesus said the story of the Good Samaritan. And of course, the Samaritans being hated were the last people on earth that were to be loved reminds us of his commandment in Matthew 5 love your enemies do good to them that hate you pray for them that despitefully use you and then he adds if you just love your friends you're no better than the Pharisees and of course the man went away with something to think about like a bride awaiting her married day and her union with her husband or a husband awaiting the day he'll be united with the woman he loves the church bears about her the mark of something that is to come. And it is reflected in love. She is not waiting in terror. She is waiting in love for her Lord. You know, my heart is full of this verse because God did not command us to believe in him nor to obey him. He commanded us to love him. This we have not done. We have believed in him, and in part we have obeyed him, and somehow we feel a reward should come. But he did not commend either of those things. We have forgotten his word. Notice the antiquity of this. You'll find it in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. It is the Shema, the creed, the believe. Hear, O Israel, it says in Deuteronomy 6. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Then it gives these verses, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God. And it goes on. That was recited in the synagogue every time they got together. It's called the Shema, which means here. This is nothing new. You cannot believe the New Testament if you ignore the Old Testament. They are interlaced like a lace that ties together two sides of one pair of shoes. Jesus never created anything new. He simply showed us an entrance by the heart into what God had always commanded. Notice the authority that he extended to us in this. It is not a suggestion, it is a commandment, and nothing could be clearer than that the fact that God ordered his people to love him. It is not an option. Do you love the Lord your God? You are commanded to do so, therefore not to do so is disobedience, and in this case we will discover disobedience to the first and the greatest commandment. What does it matter what else I have obeyed if in this I am disobedient? Notice the expectation of it as well. God does not command me to believe in him. He does not command me to obey him, though I must do both of those in order to do what he does command me, and that is to love him. What word for love is used? Is it the word that... Uh, means pleasurable love, the word eros, that from which we get the modern word erotic, love that appeals to the senses? No. Therefore, it is not based on my feelings and is not to come when I feel like it, nor is it to come because I feel good for something he has done. It is not that. Is it the love that is therefore what we call brotherly love or friendship type of love? The word phileo comes to mind gives us the word Philadelphia that's called the city of brotherly love. 
But no, it is not that word either. God does not call us to be his pals. It is the word agape. Agape is the word that is used of the love of God for sinners. It is the love that gives itself, expecting and receiving nothing in return. It is sacrificial love. It is the love that God demonstrates toward us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It is the love that goes to a cross and dies so that someone else can live. It is the love that becomes poor so that someone else can become rich. It is the love that loses. And notice something. We have, evangelicals are good at this, we have heard it over and over again, God loves us with agape love. God poured himself out for us so that we might have this and this and this. But the commandment is now pour yourself out to love him. I know the scripture that says we love him because he first loved us. And there is no question that the love came from him that is ever returned to him. But it doesn't change the commandment. The commandment says to his people, when we stand before God, this will ring in our ears, love the Lord your God at your own personal cost and sacrifice. You know, the only love some of us in the church know is the love that is on a one-way street, what I get. We can tell about God's love for us, but when we're asked about our love for him, we are mute, deaf, dumb, and blind. We cannot speak, for in fact, we do not, and we have never thought of it. God does not call us to love on feeling, and God does not call us to love on a palsy wowsy equality basis that ignores the fact that he is our sovereign creator. He, in fact, calls us to pour out to him sacrificial love that costs us something. Costly love. He does not appeal to my emotions. He appeals to my will. He does not suggest that I love him. He does not plead that I love him. He commands me to love. I love something in this. When you command a person to do something, you are saying at least this much about them. I recognize in you the, the inbuilt and inbred resiliency and power of the human spirit that can literally gather itself up and do something by the exertion of its will. We've almost forgotten this, but it's true. We're created in the image of God. God didn't create with his emotions. He created of the force of his will that says, let there be light. And there was light, and we are like that. Some of us say, I just can't do it. We are created to do it. And God commands us, and God is not a fool. He does not say, do something to a people who are impotent. But he calls forth from the human spirit what he put there, the capacity to do it. Get up and do it. So great is he, so great are we, created in his image. And he says, love me, do it. Notice the object of it. Love the Lord your God. You ever thought about the life and ministry of Jesus? He walked from one end to the other of his 30-some-odd years with one thought in mind, to please his father. He lost everything doing it. But it was his joy to please his father. Read any one of the Gospels you want this afternoon and underline every place where he thanked God. He's at the death of his friend Lazarus. And he thanks God for the opportunity to manifest God's realism and power there. Thanks God for it. He lived to love his Father. We are to love the Lord our God. Friends, anything else, even a good thing in his place, is nothing more nor less than idolatry. And we are idol worshippers as sure as the man who bows himself down before wood and stone. If anything, anything at all occupies the central place in our life where he ought to be. Notice the exclusivity of it. Love the Lord your God. He does not say with your mind. He says with all your mind. And it is underlined in red by the fact that it's repeated three times. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And then it goes back to the beginning. And with all your soul. And then back again. And with all your mind so that we'll get the point. My mind, my soul, my heart are to be his exclusively as surely as my 
self in this earth is to be my wife exclusively and to belong to no other woman. Idolatry is letting something else share the central stage with God as well. Some of us have never comprehended that God is not an addition to life. He is a replacement. It is the removal of every other thing to enthrone him at the center. And it is Jesus only. Notice the intensity of it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Luke will add this. And with all your soul and with all your strength. You know we've grown limp in the 20th century. The great heart cry of 20th century men is, I can't. There is a secret in this. If I once confess the truth that I am created in the image of God and recreated by, by rebirth, by being born again into the image of Christ, you cannot call such a person a weakling. You cannot say that they can't. But rather, the truth that leaps up at you from that is, they can. They can. And Paul says it when he underlines, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It implies effort. It implies discipline. I am taking it for granted that you understand one thing. To me, when I speak of anything like this, a person must absolutely be born again and cannot function without being filled with the Spirit in order to accomplish any of this. This is not a legalism to be laid on someone as though they carried a sack on their back. But having once entered into that, then these commandments of our Lord become incumbent upon us. God at the center, nothing else. All my effort and all my life, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. The intensity of it. Notice the instruments of it. That's what you use. My heart, my soul, my mind. There's too much there to deal with in ten sermons, so I am going to narrow it down to point out one thing and help you perhaps to get a grip on loving God with these things. First of all, let me talk about worrying. There are plenty of things to worry about in our world, so that if you dispense with one set of problems, you will soon inherit another. Worry is idolatry in that it enthrones at the center of my life a problem, and I begin to orbit around that problem so that all through the day and all through the night, there is background music playing to whatever else I happen to be doing of necessity, like going to work or eating, that focuses in and on those problems over and over and over again. Now I say to you that those things become the center of our lives, and you know right well that they do, those of you who worry. And they are therefore your God, for they control you. And you cannot Therefore, love him with all your mind, for you are exerting all of your mind, not to love, necessarily, but to serve another God. By the way, all gods are not benevolent. Most of them are hateful. Only one God is good. Every other thing that occupies the center will tear strips off your energy until you're reduced to nothing. And finally, you receive behind closed doors and withdraw because of the burden that is upon you. What is the answer to that? Is the answer to that to get a little bit of psychotherapy? Psychotherapy is helpful. But is that the answer? Is the answer to that to get out and do something like jog? Or go out and buy a new hat? Or whatever other type of answer that we might give? Is the problem that we are afflicted and like victims out there is a nasty old world that is beginning to take chunks out of us like a shark lunging at a body in the water? No. The answer is this, whether perceptibly or imperceptibly, we are tolerating an idol at the center of life. The scripture gives us many, many, many injunctions to cast
cast our cares upon him. But instead, we have enthroned them, and the cares of this life are the very center of the things that we do. And when there's nothing else to think about, our mind begins to orbit around them. And all I'm talking about right now is worry. I could talk about ambition. I could talk about possessions. I could talk about a number of other things in the same kind of language. See, remember when I talked about the center? To balance the tire? As long as we talk about what's wrong, we'll never know what's right. But God then says to us, let me tell you what's right so that you can know the center. Take stock in your heart at this moment. Do you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? And if the answer comes back, I do, then he says, you are in balance. And those of you who have ever had any experience in doing it know that is true almost automatically. And if you cannot say it, you can almost instantaneously point to a place where you've got a thump. And you keep hitting it and hitting it and hitting it again. And the answer is not to fix the thump. It is to discover where the center is. Love God with your mind. You can let your mind be used to preoccupy it with worry. That's idolatry. The answer to it is not help. It is repentance. Then help might need to come. Let me talk about study. Some of you, when I say the word study, immediately a red light that goes off says, I am not a student. I have not had an education. I cannot study. So let me start out by saying this. I don't care if study for you is nothing more than sitting down and reading the Bible. If that's the level on which you can function. God is quite well pleased with that. You may be the kind of person who can earn a doctorate in theology. If that's the level on which you can function, that's the level on which your performance is required. Most of us are somewhere in between those two. You may be doing a simple Bible study that you got this week in a little paper-bound booklet. If that's the level on which you can and do function, that's the level on which you're required to function. It's not what everybody else is doing, but what you are doing compared to what you might do is the answer. But may I ask you something else? Why are you studying what you're studying? Is it for love of God or is it for love of learning? Is it so you can dazzle them with your wisdom? Could I ask something, and this is terrible, because I'm really going to single out a certain segment of our population, but let me speak to those of you who are involved in a discipleship group right now. Have you grown to depend upon the discipleship group for your spirituality? Are you rather proud of your accomplishments? And at, in the back of your mind, are you not scratching your head and wondering why every once in a while what you're doing becomes a little bit dead and wooden? Is it because the love of God has been replaced by something else, a certain pride of accomplishment? That's not to say that you quit. That is to say that you can lose the center very quickly. Why do you study what you study? How do you love God with your mind? Let me ask you this. How much time do you spend in plain worship of God? I don't mean in prayer saying, God, I need X, Y, and Z. I mean plain worship of God. Let me help you answer the question. Describe God to me. Can you? How do you worship someone you do not know? What is he like? For worship is quietly praising him and loving him for what he is, not for what he's done or given, but for what he is. A little while ago, I memorized a list of the characteristics of God, and I go down it in my mind as a discipline when I pray. Things like love mercy and grace, and peace, and wisdom, and then the bigger words, which you have to learn the meaning for, like omnipotence and omnipresence. Oh, I can't learn big words. Well, wait a minute. Yes, you can. How much trouble have you taken to learn those? And how much time can you spend loving God for those characteristics? Do you know what omnipotence means? I thought that meant God had big muscles. <laughs> omnipotence means that God has the capacity to do everything his wisdom finds it wise to do. 
that tells me that his omnipotence is not merely demonstrated when I can see the sweep of his hand in creation. It is also demonstrated when I can see him in the control when he does nothing. You can love him in both. Did you know that? Many of us are worshipped in a great blank face in the sky. We have no idea who he is. Love him with your mind. Let me ask you a few other things. What about Thanksgiving? The Bible talks about the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Remember agape love? We're to love God with agape love. Love that costs us something. Let's see. Well, when things go wrong, you have lost something, things went bad or little or big, then's when you offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And that is a discipline of the mind to operate in certain channels that it does not normally operate in because then is when you normally lose your temper. I do too. And loving him with my mind is disciplining my mind to give thanks when I might have cursed him. Let me put it the other way around. What do you know about a complaining spirit? But a spirit that is constantly pouring forth bile about the rotten way things are going. What do you deserve, sinner? You would like maybe a little thicker icing on the cake. You don't want to go to the cross. Let him go, but I want to receive the glory. No, that's not true. We don't believe that, do we? Well, then, how do I express the fact that grace has exploded into my life and caused me to be redeemed, and one day I'm going to die and go to heaven? I replace a complaining spirit with a thanksgiving spirit, and that happens as I discipline my mind to love God. I make it do it until it learns its lesson. Because my will controls my mind. And so I am created and so I am redeemed. And my feelings can do what they want. Sooner or later they'll fall. But I will give thanks. That's loving God with your mind. Let me ask another question. Do you fast? Some of you do. I know that. Some of you do for pride. I've done it for that too. God loves us anyway. I'm more spiritual because I fasted this week. No, that's not true. Do you know what fasting is in the Old Testament? It is setting aside food, or it could be an activity, or it could be, in the New Testament, it talks about sexual pleasure. Setting that aside in order to devote myself to God. All right? Now, where's loving God with your mind in that? It is the way that you do it. Do you know what grieved God in the Old Testament? People who said, Sunday again. Or they said, Pentecost again. And the cost of it is driving me nuts. Well, they said, the Feast of Weeks, oh, Uncle Harry is coming. Or something like that. God said, you fast so that you can set yourself apart unto me and rejoice. We say, what a drag. And it grieves his soul to the ground. Do you know what we need to do? One is repent confess, yes, that has been my attitude. And the second is to say, I can't wait. So the next time I can draw a park with the Lord, I plan a time to do it. By the way, part of the discipleship group's function is to help you spend a half day in prayer. Just with God, a whole half day. You know what you'll discover? Power, joy, love, refreshing, renewal, cleansing, you name it. And you won't miss the food either. remember a roommate of mine who uh, I was going to supper in college and I was saying, Greg, you want to come with me? And Greg said, no, I'm going to skip supper. I'm just going to pray. It's about time I had a feast with the Lord. And I looked at him like he'd lost three bricks short of his loaf. You're going to pass up supper to be with God? And you're calling that a feast? what we had at supper that night. And I had a clue what he was talking about. I didn't love God with my mind. My mind says that what God says is joy is joy. And God says that fasting and setting myself apart to him is joy. And I will do it. I will love it. When the Holy Spirit sees that kind of a prepared place, he just moves in. 
about suffering. We trust God when we suffer. The greatest temptation of my life when things go wrong is to stop trusting God because I can't trust Him. You know what I mean? Stop trusting God because the evidence outside of me says that God let me down. If I'm sick, that means He let me down, doesn't it? If I'm broke, that means He let me down, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. I read an interesting passage in the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy where I believe it's the 33rd chapter where the Lord says if a false prophet comes into your midst and does miracles and people are inclined to go after him, you take him and stone him. I thought to myself, that's crazy, Lord. If he does miracles, everybody would be inclined to believe him, wouldn't they? God's answer to that was you don't believe of what you see outside. You believe because of my word. Always he brought us back to his word. And sometimes the test is simply this. God says to us, I'm going to change your outward circumstances so that they are the exact opposite of what you think they ought to be, trusting me. I'm going to contradict everything you know. I'm going to lay it down so that it looks like God has forsaken you. Why? Because I want you to have an opportunity to say, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. Paul went through all of that in the Old Testament. If you read the litany of his griefs, I've been to jail how many times? I've been whipped how many times? I've been shipwrecked how many times? I've been thrown out of the synagogue how many times? I've been left for dead how many times? But it had done its work in him. God was faithful in all of those times. You know, when they're bringing the lash down upon your back, that's the time when you find out if you can trust him. That's the time when I find out too. Suffering trusting God. Do you know why we don't trust God? Because we don't trust Him. Why don't I trust Him in this circumstance where something's gone wrong? Because in general, I'm not altogether certain that He's trustworthy. And why am I not altogether certain that He's trustworthy? I've not committed myself to what He said. I'm not willing to take the risk of believing it, even when things look Second Thessalonians, the third chapter and the fifth verse. And Jude 21 are two verses I want to read, and then I'll close. The first one is, May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. If I can paraphrase that in a way that renders what I believe it is saying there. It reads, May the Lord direct your hearts into loving God and persevering like Christ. He's asking that God direct these people into learning how to do that. The second is Jude, the 21st chapter. Excuse me, she doesn't have any chapters. I mean the 21st verse. Jude comes just before Revelation. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Let me paraphrase it again. Keep yourselves loving God. Wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. The Evangelical Christian Church has often found itself uncomfortable with the fact that many outside its fold, who nevertheless claim to be Christians, seem to understand this truth better than they. We are not very often alone with God. We are not ones who are prone to give up the ordinary things of life in order to serve Him. Then, when we see someone who has, for instance, joined a monastery to spend his entire life in silence, and in obvious sacrifice, though that does not necessarily validate it, 
And when we see that, we ask ourselves the question, how can they do better? There is a lesson for us to learn. The lesson for us is in this. We all, not some, but all, are called to love God. He does call us to do the loving in the course of life. And not many are called to separate themselves from it. But when we stand before him, this first and greatest commandment, and the second one which is like it, will be laid before us. And the question will not be, how much have we obeyed, how much have we believed, or how much have we done? How much have we loved? I find that a startling corrective to some of the things I'm allowing to happen in my life. And I recognize that have already begun to swing the wheel as it were of a great ship. The wheel is swung. It'll take a while to turn the craft around. So it may be for you. Friends, we have to do this. We have to start now. We begin this morning by repenting of our lack of love and our failure to devote with all of our heart and soul and mind ourselves to our God. To cast down the items that are there, the things, either good or bad, that got in his way and have no place. To tear them down and to remove anything that supports them. And to begin the process of returning, that's what repentance means, returning to the Lord our God. Let's bow together and pray quietly. I'm going to ask Wes to prepare to lead us again in the singing of the remaining verses of 76. When we sing, we will receive the benevolent offering from you. At this moment, I wish you to just spend a few moments quietly with the Lord.